Oh, yay. Oh, yay. Oh, yay. The Court of Appeals for the Fourth Judicial Appellate District is now open pursuant to call. Well, good morning, uh, gentlemen. Uh, Council, if you could please uh, put yourself back on video so we can get started. Mr. Brandon? Yep, I thought I did. There you go. Very good. Well, good morning. Welcome to the Fourth Court of Appeals. Um, because of COVID-19, uh, the courts of appeals are unable to have in-person hearings at this time. So this is uh, the first time the Court of Appeals in the Fourth District has held oral arguments on Zoom. So rest assured that if there are any technical difficulties, we will, um, we will disconnect if, if, or if we're disconnected and we will resume and give you the time back that, uh, that you may have lost. You also may be aware that on May 8th, uh, most of the Texas appellate courts, including this court, was um, the victim uh, of of a ransomware attack, and it has taken down the, the networks, uh, including ours. However, be assured that uh, we have the entire appellate record in this case, including the clerk's record, the reporter's record, and of course, your briefing. And finally, just a housekeeping matter, the judges have decided that we will raise our hands when we have a question. So please, um, please, that is your cue to stop uh, stop talking and allow the judge to ask her question. So with that, those, uh, with that out of the way, let me call for announcements in this case. It's Jose Gonzalez versus the state of Texas. Barry Hitchings for the appellant, uh, Jose Trinidad Gonzalez. We're ready, Your Honor. Hey, Brandon, I'm representing the state. I'm ready. Very well. As you both know, you'll have 20 minutes to make your respective arguments. And then, of course, Mr. Hitching, you, you will have 10 minutes uh, for rebuttal on behalf of your client, the appellant in this case. So with that, Mr. Hitchings, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Chief Justice Marion, Justice Alvarez, Justice Rodriguez, may it please the court. Uh, just a short introductory background, the briefs on the background may very well have uh, uh, exhausted your patience, but just a short introductory background. This case starts with appellant's wife of two months, Sandra King. She took appellant's iPad that contained several sexually explicit videos of appellant and Sandra King's daughter to the San Antonio Police Department substation. Uh, the husband was asleep at the time. He had worked uh, uh, a night shift at his employment. He came back and he was tired and he went to bed. Uh, so he was not aware of what was happening. The husband, typically with regard to his iPad, as stated in the breeze, uh, required his wife to get permission anytime she wanted to use it. He had to give his okay. Uh, the wife, without his permission, uh, went into the iPad. She went to the deleted and trash files and was able to open them up. And she was very much surprised at what she saw. She proceeded to take the iPad to a San Antonio Police Department substation. And there she met an officer, Bianca Garcia, with the San Antonio Police Department. That was the first officer that she came into contact with. Uh, the videos on the iPad, uh, by my count, were viewed by at least two San Antonio Police Department officers, uh, Officer Bianca Garcia and a Detective Ronald Soto. Uh, and when she first met with Officer Garcia, she had explained that this was her husband's iPad, not her iPad. Uh, the officer Garcia was the first officer. She viewed the videos and, and then the video was turned over uh, to a sergeant, not a sergeant, but a detective, Charles Marcus. And then the videos then were subsequently turned over to Detective Ronald Soto. 
Detective Soto viewed the videos. The officers then proceeded with additional support uh, from the officer corps of the police department to go to the appellant's home and they took appellant into custody and Detective Ronald Soto then proceeded after viewing the videos to conduct a custodial interrogation. Uh, as a result of that custodial interrogation, Sergeant, or not Sergeant, Detective Soto was able to secure a confession from the appellant. Uh, a day later, uh, another San Antonio Police Department detective, a Detective Adrian Rama, Adrian Owens, uh, thought it would be a good idea to get a search warrant. Uh, and so Detective Owens prepared a search warrant. The search warrant uh, very carefully omitted references to the prior video viewings by both Officer Garcia and Detective Soto. Uh, and uh, pretty much relied just upon what Sandra King had orally told Bianca Garcia. Uh, the uh, affidavit in support of the search warrant uh, and the search warrant went before Judge Sid Harrell uh, approximately 37 hours after, after the wife had taken the uh, videos to the substation. Uh, uh, Judge Harrell signed the search warrant. Uh, later in court proceedings, a motion to suppress was denied at a pretrial motion to suppress hearing. And a jury subsequently found appellant guilty on 11 counts uh, all of the counts in the indictment. Now, the issues uh, in this case, in the appellant's brief, the appellant uh, uh, went into really great detail on two very important appellate court cases. The first case is Rodriguez versus State at 521 Southwest 3rd, page 1, the Court of Criminal Appeals, 2017 case. This is a no search warrant case absolutely no search warrant at all. And so in this kind of case, the state would be required to show that the search fell into one of the five recognized exceptions uh, involving a no search warrant case. It appears that the, the state, uh, by the emphasis on Sandra King, was relying on the first exception, which is the consent exception. The second case is Ruiz versus. Excuse State. me, Mr. Um, Mr. Hitching, excuse me, I have a question. Are you suggesting that um, Ms. King violated, you know, did some sort of illegal search or violated the law in any way when she um, opened the iPad of her husband? Well, with regard to violating the law, the courts, uh, I'm, I'm very well aware. Uh, in the uh, Ruiz decision, this fourth court emphasized that a private person, uh, uh, any search done by a private person isn't covered by the Fourth Amendment. And so she was free to do what she wants to. In the, in, in the context of this case, uh, my objection is with the viewings that happen later. Okay, that's what I wanted to ask you about. So she she opens it. She has a she has the passcode or passcode to get in. She sees what what appears to be um, you know a sexual assault against her daughter and takes it to the police. Now, was there any evidence that the police at the station looked at anything more than what she showed to them? Like, did they do their own search or did did the evidence establish that, that they only viewed what she opened it up and showed them? Well, the record's unclear, uh, Chief Justice Marriott, on this. The reason I say that is because she viewed the videos with the first officer, Officer Bianca Garcia. After that, the record shows that Detective Ronald Soto, the record says that he viewed him in a detective's patrol car. I don't know who was with him. It sounds like from the record, it's another detective's patrol car. We don't know. 
but that's where he viewed it. We're not okay. Sure. So at what? Excuse me. At what point do you uh, contend that the Fourth Amendment was violated when the when Officer Garcia was shown the video, or later when the next uh, officer or detective saw the video? Uh, probably if law enforcement had it to do all over again. At the moment, Sandra King took the videos and explained what was on them. Somebody that should have raised red flags and somebody should have said, stop, we need to get a search warrant. That would have been the safe way. It's my contention at that point in time, that's when the Fourth Amendment comes into play. Uh, when Officer Garcia views the videos, later when Detective uh, Soto views the videos, uh, it's sort of suggested from the record that Detective Adrian uh, Owens also viewed the videos. Uh, I'm not sure whose detective's patrol car that Detective Soto was in, uh, but there may have been another detective in that patrol car that also viewed them. So there were multiple viewings of those videos uh, that I think implicate the Fourth Amendment. I have a question. Yes, Justice. Um, Mr. Hitchings, if um, you're not contending that Ms. King didn't have the authority to have access to that iPad, are you? Well, in the Rodriguez case, uh, which is a no search warrant case, because that's what this case would be at this posture. It's mm -hmm. still a no search warrant case. Uh, the Rodriguez uh, opinion uh, talks about both actual authority and apparent authority. Uh, I think it's clear, as we say in the brief, from the testimony she presented that she didn't have any authority, either actual or apparent, although apparent is more in the eyes of the person listening. It would be in the eyes of Officer Garcia. If all the semblances were there, that yes, she should have had authority. But when she says, it's not my iPad, it's my husband's, uh, Officer Garcia answers the questions, both at the pretrial hearing and at, at trial that the, the, the videos are the husband's. It's but pretty Mr. much his separate properties. If, if I may interrupt you, um, she did, did, um, did, your, did um, Mr. Gonzalez have the iPad locked up in some secure safe? Did he not share the passwords with anyone? Or isn't it true that basically she had access to the iPad, she had the password to get in the iPad. In fact, she had used the iPad, the child had used the iPad in the past. Isn't that some evidence um, uh, to consider in terms of her having a parent authority? Uh, it could be. Uh, I think they may very well have been operating uh, under the honor system in the past. Uh, all wishes to use it were proceeded with a question to Mr. Uh, 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 Jose Trinidad Gonzalez, can we use it? And he pretty much always indicated it was okay. And yes, you could use it. Okay, uh, so you're not arguing that that ownership is required uh, to have apparent authority of property. Is, is that right? No, I'm, I'm not arguing that at all. Just uh, from the standpoint of the recipient, the one who's going to make that judgment call, is there apparent authority? Uh, what do the facts indicate? Uh, so, I so assume with me if for a moment, Mr. Hitchings, that she did have apparent authority. Let's just assume that. Um, what would be the issue with her going to the police to show them something, some, some property over which she has apparent authority to do? She wasn't, um, she didn't steal the property and then take it to the police, assume that she had apparent authority. So how do we get past or, or what is your issue with her taking it to the police and showing it to them? Well, she uh, obviously violated uh, an understanding between her and her husband. I suspect that uh, uh, 
Oh, she never expected uh, to find out uh, what she found on the videos. And I think she could say, well, uh, her trust in her husband was violated. But uh, she, under Ruiz, she did have a right to do exactly what she did. We're not really complaining about Sandra King. Uh, she's a private citizen and she, she can do what she did. It's just whether a parent authority or, or uh, actual authority, when it gets to the recipient and you are informed what's on the videos, at that point in time, uh, that's when a search warrant should have happened. If we fast forward, uh, later, when the actual search warrant affidavit is taken to Judge Sid Harrell, Judge Sid Harrell approves the search warrant based solely on what Sandra King had said, not in the details. And she tell, tell me, Mr. Hitchings, what difference does that make, that the affidavit that was submitted to Judge Harrell for the search warrant didn't include what the police saw, only included what Ms. King said. Well, I think one, that raises the issue that was a deceptive affidavit uh, in support of the search warrant. It certainly was not full disclosure. It was the police department less, being less than candid with uh, Judge Harrell. Judge Harrell very well could have decided uh, if given full disclosure, exactly what appellant's trial attorney, Jeff Mulder said. After all this time, when everybody has viewed it, uh, why even obtain a search warrant? He asked that to Officer Bianca Garcia. Officer Garcia's response, uh, that's a question I cannot answer uh, in my capacity as a patrol officer. Judge Harl may very well have asked that and he may have concluded, well, everybody's seen it. You want a search warrant for the videos, but everybody's already viewed it. I'm going to deny the search warrant. That, that, and of course, this is all conjecture, but Judge Harl easily could have made that conclusion. So, Justice Alvarez. Thank you. I had the microphone off. So, uh, I, just to make sure, you're, you're not... You're not, um, whether Mrs. King had apparent authority or actual authority to view the iPad, that's not your issue. Your issue is that uh, the police department went beyond what she had permission to do. Is that what you're saying? Well, the police department obviously went, went beyond what she had authority to do. Uh, no. That's that's your, your 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 argument for the Fourth Amendment. You're saying Rodriguez doesn't apply because the police department went beyond what she had authority to do. Well, I, I, I have one could, could say for the first uh, Justice Rodriguez. Yes, I'm sorry to interrupt, but just for clarification purposes, um, did the police look at anything other than what Miss King showed them prior to? obtaining the search warrant? In other words, did they exceed the scope of what Ms. King had access to prior to getting the search warrant? And that, if you can answer my question after that, I really appreciate it. That, that, that's kind of uh, hard to say. I, I, I wasn't uh, there uh, when Detective Soto, for example, uh, viewed the, the, the search warrants, or not sure, the, the, uh, the videos. Uh, I don't know if he went beyond uh, what was shown to Officer Garcia. I don't know if he went beyond uh, what later was in the uh, uh, affidavit and supported the search warrant as to uh, Sandra Garcia's statement. I, I, I just don't know. And Justice Alvarez, your question was? My question, I was just trying to, what you're saying is that <clears throat> the authority issue is not important. What is important is that uh, they went beyond what she had authority to do, but you've answered that question uh, to Judge Rodriguez, Justice Rodriguez, so. 
if you can, if you need to develop it, please do so. Right, right. Just uh, I would contend, since for the first 37 hours, this was a no search warrant case, in no search warrant cases, authority uh, uh, is important. Uh, at the 37th hour, once the uh, search warrant is signed, then it becomes a search warrant case. That's why Gonzalez is a, a little different. You've got Rodriguez that's a no search warrant case. You have Ruiz that is a search warrant case. And then you have Gonzalez that's kind of both. For 37 hours, it's a no search warrant case. Then with the search warrant, it becomes a search warrant case. But, uh, oh, I see my time is a little, uh, slipping a little bit away. I have one, one final question, Mr. Hitchings. Are you suggesting then that that the police officers should have questioned Ms. King further about her, her authority to show them what she thought was criminal activity going on. Should they have done more? I, and I, I realize your position is they should have just gone and gotten a search warrant. Right. But before we get to that, if someone with apparent authority brings evidence of a crime to a police officer who wants to investigate it, are you suggesting that they should have done more to determine whether or not she in fact had that authority? Oh, she, she uh, uh, they could have, for example, Detective Soto. Uh, when he is asked, he says, well, I just speculated that uh, it was community property. Uh, apparently Sandra King or, or uh, uh, Bianca Garcia, Officer Garcia didn't talk to Soto to, to tell him, oh no, no, this is uh, appellant's property not community property, uh, but he just speculated. And then finally he concedes, well, he's not really sure. Uh, they, they could have asked a lot more questions. I think the big issue is those red flags should have gone out all over as soon as they learned from Sandra King exactly what was on the videos. The safe course would have been stop everything, apply for a search warrant, uh, Judge Harl would have granted it just based on what ultimately he decided based solely on Sandra King's uh, uh, presentation to Officer Garcia. Uh, that's what should have happened. Uh, see, my time is about to run out, so I'll reserve the rest for rebuttal. Thank you very much, Mr. Hitchings. Yeah, you'll have 10 minutes for rebuttal. All right, Mr. Brandon. May it please the court. Um, I understand why this court granted oral argument in this case. A lot of appellate courts have been grappling with search issues the last few years, up to and including the United States Supreme Court, especially when it relates to electronics, as in this case. This case, the trial judge's decision not to suppress the videos was correct for so many reasons. If the police officer had walked up to the defendant, grabbed the iPad out of his hands and started going through it, looking in folders, checking contents. Of course, that would have been a search. There are many cases by this time that say looking through the contents of an electronic device is a search, but that's not what happened as we know. Instead, she, the wife of the defendant came into the substation carrying an iPad and said, I have evidence here that my husband has been raping my 10 year old daughter look at this and hits play and puts it in front of the officer's face. That's not a search on the part of the officer, but that's just the officer watching what's passing before her eyes. Whether I can, I can tell by your questions that you saw what I filed on Friday, a uh, letter of uh, additional authorities, whether the wife had actual authority or parent authority to search the iPad isn't an issue because the Court of Criminal Appeals has made abundantly clear as recently as last year in the Ruiz case that um, a search by a private citizen doesn't implicate Article 38.23 or the Fourth Amendment. Um, the court made very clear that searches by private citizens cannot be the basis for motion to suppress evidence. So it doesn't matter about the wife's search. And then the search by uh, the when she shows the video to the officer in the police station, that's not a search by the officer either. 
we can think of a lot of analogies from real life. If a police officer walks up to someone on the street and says, I think you have drugs on you and reaches into his pocket and pulls out a baggie, that's clearly a search. But if the police officer is sitting at the counter, just to Alvarez, I love this system that you have to raise your hand and I get to call on you. I, I, this, I hope this continues for the rest of my career. Well, even let's assume in this, couldn't she have to, couldn't the officer Garcia had declined to view the iPad once uh, uh, Mrs. King showed it to her and then obtained the, the warrant before going in and looking into it. When a woman comes into the station holding the iPad in obvious control of it, using the password, clicking on play, what reasonable police officer is going to ignore evidence of a crime? That's what they're there to do. Yeah, but in Greece, in Greece uh, the issue in Greece was exactly the same. Uh, once the, the iPad was shown or the iPhone was shown, then everything stopped until they got a warrant. So couldn't have they done it that way here in order to prevent uh, 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 a Fourth Amendment violation? Well, there wasn't any Fourth Amendment violation because, you know, it was searched by a private citizen. But uh, I don't think that's the way we would reasonably expect police officers to behave. They're there to investigate crimes. And when she says, back at my house right now the man in my house is sexually assaulting the girl in my house uh don't you want the police to act on that as quickly as possible what's what's important about a search is whether it's reasonable or not and when somebody comes up and just sticks something in front of the police officer's face i believe that's a reasonable search but um another uh aspect of i gave the court another case uh called um uh, Sims v. State from last year, uh, Court of Criminal Appeals case, which just kind of shows the evolution of how we think about search issues. Uh, it used to be a, a physical intrusion was required, like a police officer planting a tracking device on a car. And now courts have come to use a reasonable expectation of privacy model that whether the defendant had a reasonable expectation of privacy in place being searched. I don't think this defendant had a reasonable expectation of privacy in an iPad that he had shared with the whole family and given his wife the password and she had used it in the past without his explicit authority. But put all that aside, put aside the first search, put aside the first viewing, put aside all of that and still the police then obtained a warrant. And the other cases I gave the court, uh, Pear v. State and Johnson v. State and a host of other cases say if the police get a valid warrant to search something even if the earlier search is questionable, which I don't think this one was, but let's say it was, even if this search was questionable, police then got a valid search warrant before they seized the iPad formally. But yeah. by then, um, they had already brought uh, Mr. Gonzalez down to the station, questioned him, gotten a, um, a statement from him, and but he was under arrest by then. So by the time they, they got the, the search warrant, all of that had transpired. So doesn't that, I mean, it's kind of like water under the bridge then. They've, they've already arrested him, gotten a statement, and then they get the warrant. Well, this is the defendant saying, Justice Rodriguez. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm gonna follow up just briefly. Was there any reason articulated that they did not get the search warrant after Garcia, the very first officer, viewed what was, um, a crime on the iPad, what was the reason or what, what was their rationale for not stopping at that point in time as Judge Alvarez suggested and gone and gotten the warrant? Was, was that articulated at all? No, but I think it's obvious from the situation that, that they thought there was an ongoing danger to the victim because she was back in the house with the person who had sexually assaulted her. So, so she had not, mom had not dropped daughter off at grandma's house and then gone to the police station? No, okay, I've read that, but I also read that, um, yeah, that she was back at the house. So I wasn't sure what the evidence showed. These are two different issues. I can skip ahead to the arrest of the defendant, but let me just finish up here on the search is that the defendant wants to have it both ways is that the police should have gotten a warrant, but then there was no point in the police getting a warrant, but the police did get a warrant. And the cases say when that happens, it breaks the chain of causation in the evidence being admitted. It's, it's no longer 
a product of a search by a private citizen, legal or, or illegal, or first police officer search. They left out the police officer viewing the videos on the iPad because that's exactly what they were supposed to do. They didn't use the evidence obtained in the questionable search. They used her coming into the station and saying, my husband has been raping my daughter. So the cases say in that situation, once they obtain the valid search warrant, the evidence was admitted pursuant to that valid search warrant. Not, and so there was no violation of Article 3823. There was a valid search warrant. Now, let me skip ahead to the warrantless arrest of the defendant. Um, there are several exceptions to the warrant requirement, and at least three of them apply in this case. When the police went to the home right after that, like you would hope police officers would do when presented with evidence of a crime and possibly an ongoing crime, the, the, the wife let them into the house, as she had a right to do. She would live there, too. And they found the defendant sitting on a couch with the victim, the very victim they had just seen in the video. So one of the exceptions to the warrant requirement is if victim, if the probable cause, if police have probable cause to believe a crime has been committed and the victim is still in danger from the defendant. Clearly she was, she's there right next to him on the couch. So in any case in that situation, police are going to arrest that man. They're not gonna leave him in the house with the girl. That's one exception to the warrant requirement. Another exception is when police have probable cause to believe that a defendant has committed a crime involving family violence, which this was because this was his stepdaughter. So there's a second exception. But the exception I'd like the court to look at in this case is the one found in 14.01 of the Code of Criminal Procedure, which says, if an officer sees a crime being committed in plain view in front of her, she can arrest without a warrant. And the reason for that is if an officer sees a crime being committed, then she's 100% sure that the crime happened. In that situation, if the officer is on the beat and sees someone committing a robbery with a gun, she knows for an absolute fact that that person has committed a crime. So there's no reason for her to have to go to an impartial magistrate and say, here's my evidence. And the impartial magistrate goes, mm, yeah, that looks to me like probable cause to believe a crime is committed. No, she knows for a certainty that a crime has been committed because she's seen it. The same is true when the officers in this case saw the crime being committed on the defendant's iPad. It was an, it was an actual depiction, Justice Marion. Yes. Um, do you not see a distinction between an officer seeing a crime being committed versus an officer seeing a crime that was committed? I mean, there is a little, there is a distinction here in my mind, and maybe, uh, and, and I want your uh, help on this, that what you just described is an officer walking down the street and seeing a crime being committed versus, this is a video. It could have happened two years ago. Um, and so there is a distinction in my mind. So explain to me why it's, you want us to focus on 1401. That's my argument to the court. It could have happened two years ago. It's still the depiction of a crime that the officers can see had happened. Ironically, we have the perfect example right now. You're looking at me. We're not in the same room. I'm on a screen, but you can see me perfectly well, you know, from the shoulders up. Um, if you saw me committing a crime and you were a police officer right now, you, I believe you should have the right to come and arrest me for the exact same reason. The law should evolve as the world evolves. And now there's so many screens in our lives and they show, they depict the crime in complete detail. Out of the last four murder appeals I've done, in three of them, the murder has been caught on tape, uh, either by security cameras at a business or by a security home system in a neighborhood. There's so many times now when officers see for an absolute fact that a crime has been committed. It's not right before their eyes, it's on a screen like I am now to you, but you can still see it happening. And I believe when the rationale behind the exception applies in one form, it should be extended to a slightly different form. That's what I'm arguing. And I'd like the court to address that argument in this case. Some appellate court is going to address this. This is gonna be a recurring issue. And I'd like this court to be the first. As far as I can tell, you would be the first court to address this. The law should evolve as the world evolves. 
Justice Rodriguez. Mr. Brandon, you referenced some other cases in which murders were caught on video. Um, in those cases, did the law enforcement officer investigating the case use that information to obtain a search warrant before going and, and completing the investigation? Or did they immediately go just after doing the video and arrest that person? Well, in one of them, uh, the murder happened at a gas station and police did go there and you know the body was still there. So obviously there's been a crime and they did look at the video and try to determine who that was. And another one, there was a home security system, police were called and they did see the video. There was no uh, search issue in those cases because the, the person or the business entity who took the video just voluntarily gave it to the police. But it's just, it just shows um, another tool that law enforcement officers have now in solving crimes that some of them are ridiculously easy to solve because it's right there in front of them. So um, I guess they use that to get arrest warrants. It wasn't issues in those cases. So, so I guess my, my question really is, um, if there was no possibility of, I mean, if there was no possibility or no evidence indicating that um, Mr. Gonzalez was was fleeing at the very moment that this was all happening, that was, you know, that he was trying to get away, um, you know, where the officers would have had exigent circumstances to go without a warrant to arrest him. What what was the what would have been onerous about going and getting a search warrant, just signing an affidavit is, uh, with that limited information, which in all likelihood would have been signed. What, what would have been the problem, I guess, is what I'm trying to figure out. Well, again, this is two separate issues. This is the search issue and the arrest issue. And the arrest uh, exceptions to the warrant requirement don't require exigent circumstances. They just require those circumstances to be in place. So uh, it's really two separate issues. They're, they're obtaining evidence, which they can do later with a search warrant. And they may have thought that there was some necessity of acting quickly to arrest the defendant because he's there still with the victim of the crime. Uh, there, I don't believe there was any testimony about their needing to rush to stop an ongoing crime, but that's not required under the exceptions to the warrant requirement. And uh, the third issue, I believe, is adequately addressed in my brief. If there aren't any more questions, thank you for evolving in your use of technology. And I look forward to one day seeing you again in real life. Any other questions, Your Honors? All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Brandon. Thank you. Mr. Hitchings, you, you may proceed. You're on Mr. mute, Mr. Hitchings. Yeah, I think you're on mute, Mr. Hitchings. There we go. Okay, and hopefully everybody can hear me now. Um, where Justice Rodriguez had left off on the question of Mr. Brandon about uh, uh, what problem there would be in getting a warrant. Ultimately, in this case, we saw there's no problem at all. Just on the facts that uh, Sandra King laid out to Bianca Garcia, uh, he would have signed it. Uh, and when you go back to the cases cited in the brief, uh, oh, Rodriguez and Ruiz, uh, in those cases, uh, it was recognized that it's, it's in all, all three cases, Rodriguez, uh, Ruiz, Ruiz, where there actually was a timely search warrant, and in the case of uh, Mr. Gonzalez, this case, in all three cases, uh, it wasn't going to be difficult to get a search warrant at all. Uh, in fact, in all three cases, the item seized were not in danger of destruction. Uh, with regard to Mr. Rodriguez, when they went to the home, he was taken. They still could have immediately done a warrant at that point. 
but they didn't. Uh, you know, it took 37 hours. Uh, and then they had to kind of fudge the facts a little bit in the application for a warrant to have something less than full disclosure to Judge Harrell. Uh, Mr. Brandon had talked about a break in the chain of causation uh, in the cases that he cited. Uh, oh, I think he had cited, uh, I believe I'm pronouncing it correctly, uh, Monge versus State, and then Monge versus State is found at 315 Southwest 3rd, 35. Uh, Martinez versus State at 589 Southwest 3rd, uh, 869. Uh, those uh, bring out what Mr. Brandon was talking about uh, as a chain of causation, but it's under the rubric of the attenuation doctrine. And in those particular cases, uh, the chain was broken before the defendant, in fact, gave a uh, confession. In the case of Mr. Gonzalez, he's already given a confession uh, to Detective Ronald Soto, uh, Chief Justice. And, yeah, Mr. Hitchinson, explain to me, um, counsel uh, said that that they needed to get quickly back to the house. You know, they, they see the video, they, they know the girl is at the house with, with Mr. Gonzalez. And so there was some sort of, you know, need to quickly get there because there may be more crime occurring. So respond, if you will, to that argument. And also, was there testimony that she was still back at the house with with Mr. Gonzalez when they were at the police station? Did anybody testify to that? Or do you recall? Uh, the, the testimony, as I recall from the record, was uh, when uh, there was Officer Garcia, Officer Soto, Detective Weathersby, uh, there was a sergeant that was there. There were about five or six officers. When they got there at the house on Inks Farm Street, uh, the appellant, Jose Trinidad uh, Gonzalez, was sitting there on the couch with the uh, uh, daughter of Sandra King. Uh, there's that testimony. Uh, I don't know of any other testimony other than that, putting them in the same house, same room, after Sandra King had uh, delivered the, uh, uh, the iPad videos. Uh, but uh, anyway, in the attenuation, can I follow up with a question sure. on, on that? If there is testimony that the officers knew that she was back at the house with Mr. Gonzalez, would that change anything in your argument about whether or not the police needed to stop and go get a warrant at that time? Well, uh, you could do both at the same time. You can immediately go over there, which they did with five officers, and you can have another officer prepare the search warrant. Uh, that would have made things uh, a whole lot easier and we wouldn't be having this discussion today. I think the general rule, if there's any doubt, get a warrant. Uh, then you don't have to be arguing about these things like the five exceptions. Uh, 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 to the without a warrant uh, uh, type situation. You know, you have the warrant, uh, that solves a lot of problems, but uh, that wasn't the case here. Uh, in the uh, attenuation doctrine, as far as the chain of causation, uh, I would submit there is a case, uh, uh, in fact, it's out of this uh, fourth court of appeals, uh, it's a, it's a case called McKinney versus State at 444 Southwest 3rd, 128. It's a decision by Justice Angelini of the Fourth Court of Appeals. And I think Justice Marion and Justice Alvarez, you were both on that uh, panel in McKinney. It gives in about two pages a very thorough discussion of the attenuation doctrine and the concept of 
intervening circumstances that break the chain of causation. Uh, uh, opposing counsel's argument is the chain of causation was broken, broken when law enforcement sought a uh, search warrant from Judge Harrell to more thoroughly search, not just search, but to more thoroughly search the videos. It's kind of like Officer Garcia didn't do a thorough search, she just did a search. Officer Soto, Detective Soto, didn't do a thorough search. His was just a search. Uh, the chain of causation, it wasn't broken. It, he was al he'd already confessed. He had already made his statement. He was in custody. He was under arrest. Everything had been done. On the McKinney case, it, it, it's in a way, it's kind of like the facts in this case. Uh, in San Antonio, detective patrol car rolled around and it saw two people talking and that was a high crime area. And then one of them just took off walk, uh, running, running between houses. He was subsequently apprehended, a questionable search, and he was searched and surprise, surprise, they found drugs on him. Uh, well, that's a questionable search. Well, but then the issue of chain of causation and the attenuation, the attenuation doctrine comes into play. Uh, questionable at that point, but lo and behold, on the computer search, they find that there is an outstanding warrant for assault bodily injury. There was, in the McKinney case, a claim that that broke the chain of causation. The fourth court of appeal held that no, it did not. Uh, he was already uh, a re uh, Justice Rodriguez. Sorry to interrupt you, but I just want for clarification purposes, are you arguing that the instances in which Ms. King showed the iPad to the officers, that that is considered a search? Uh, I would submit when they opened, them up, opened it up and looked at it, that uh, that would be a search. Okay, but Clarify for me when that point, when in, in the timeline of events that point comes. Is it when Miss King is showing them the iPad? Because I don't know unless you can point me to where in the record it shows with clarity that the officers on their own volition were looking at the iPad without her showing it to them. Well, with Bianca, Officer Bianca Bar Garcia, uh, uh, when that, uh, the videos start rolling uh, and Officer Garcia is seeing the videos. At that point, I would contend that's, that's a search. A search warrant should have been obtained. When Officer Soto or Detective Soto in the patrol car views the videos, I'm not sure what videos he was viewing, but he certainly viewed some videos in a patrol car. And then he's part of the group that goes out to the, the, the home and apprehends uh, the appellant, takes him to the San Antonio police station, conducts a custodial interrogation, and he arrests uh, the appellant at that point. That was a product of the video search that he had conducted. Uh, and it, 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 it would have resolved everything if before that happened, there was a search warrant. Judge Harl had indicated by what he ultimately did that he would have granted it just based on Sandra King's testimony. Uh, but we didn't have to go through these subsequent uh, uh, invalid searches. Uh, it's also- All right, Mr. Hitchings, I think, I think you're out of time. So let's wrap up. Okay, well, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, the appellant obviously is requesting the court to reverse the judgment of the trial court. Uh, as I say in the closing of the brief, uh, enter a judgment of acquittal, if not reverse and remand to the uh, trial court. All right. Well, thank you both very much for your arguments. Uh, we appreciate it and court will be in recess until 1030. Thank you, your honors. Thank you.